Okay, and I can start the recording. Hi, good evening. Good Hello. evening. Good evening. <laughs> so we have Mr. Daniel here. Um, we have Toyo C uh, Salt Lady and uh we have a few other people in the house. We have our technical supports, um, Mr. Israel, Victor Barbary Day, and we are just waiting for a few more minutes. We will start the webinar. Maybe we should give everybody like four minutes. So by 4, 5 p.m. Eastern, we'll start so we can have more people join, um, join us. So uh, please, please be okay, we would also have to mute some people. Hi. Hello, welcome. Then let me make Salt Lady a Toyasi. Where's Toyasi? Um, why do we have waiting room admit? We we can admit everybody at the same time. It's because when some people are kicked out, um, if the capacity is too much, <laughs> so um, we may want to selectively admit some people if the room is too much. So if you were to get, get kicked out, for instance, and the room is full, we will be able yeah. to admit you and unfortunately kick out someone else. <laughs> so... <laughs> But yeah, we, we we can admit everybody with a single button. So yeah, you're welcome, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. We are waiting for two. We have two more minutes just to make sure we have a lot more people. We currently have 66 people in the room. And we are hoping to start once we get to like 70 people. Yeah, we are going to hit 100, 100 participants soon. Oh, that's great. So we have one minute left and
Okay, so I think we can start. Um, Ms. Toyosi, soft lady, if you're there, who would, you know, it would be nice to have you on camera. Um, so, oh, welcome. I didn't know your camera. Oh, okay. So, welcome, everybody. Um, it is my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon or evening or night, depending on where you are. Um, We're currently here with um, Mr. Daniel. Uh, ba and uh, Miss Toyo Siolola Mutilola, also known as Salt Lady, and myself, Victor Adeboye. Um, so a few months ago, um, Toyo Si had an initiative to bring together Africans who are doing their graduate school here in the US um, because a lot of people were not aware of the opportunities for immigration to the US that were available to them by virtue of their advanced degree. So um, Salt Lady came up with the initiative, um, discussed with some of us, and she created a WhatsApp group chat that has eventually ballooned up to three different groups containing about 1,025 participants each. And we have shared a couple of resources with people. We have a lot of our friends who are doing this processing to get the US green card. And we have a lot of people who have done the process. Some are in the middle of the process. And we are just trying to help ourselves, fellow Africans, to understand what the process is like and um, how best to navigate it. So tonight, we have Mr. Daniel and Toyo C and myself. And our technical director is Israel. Um, so Toyo C is actually a PhD student and a graduate student, uh, graduate assistant in the Department of Communications at the University of North Dakota in the US. So her research is focused on social media and the effects on mental health. So before starting her PhD at University of North Dakota, she studied at Tarleton State University, where she got an MA in Communication and Media Studies. She also studied mass communications in Nigeria at the University of Benin. So she refers to herself as a professional troublemaker, igniting critical thinking. Um, she, outside the class, she's a TEDx organizer, and she recently organized the TEDx Yaba Street program. And she also has plans of um, organizing the TEDx <clears throat> somewhere in North Dakota as well. So we are pleased to have Toyosi here. She's the main brain behind what we're doing this evening. So welcome, Ms. Toyosi. Um, and next, we have our guest speaker for tonight. We have um, Mr. Daniel Aniniba. He, Mr. Daniel is one of our resource persons. He's a Ghanaian immigrant who holds two master's degree in environmental science from the Rochester Institute of Technology in the US. Um, he began his education in Ghana, where he graduated with a bachelor's in environmental science from the University of Cape Coast, after which he got a full Government of Ghana scholarship to study in the United States. So he works in healthcare, and on part-time, he manages his immigration office on full-time. So he's married with three kids, and they live in upstate New York. So we are pleased to have Mr. Daniel in our midst. And... Uh, Finally, we have Israel, who is our technical support staff, who has been very helpful, and he runs and he runs a technical service company in Nigeria. They provide websites and 
you know, they help us run webinars and things like this. So his name is Innoventa, the name of his company. And definitely feel free to reach out to me if you need more help or more information about him. So yes, without further ado, we delve, delve straight into the webinar. Over to you, Mr. Daniel. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Victor. Uh, thank you, uh, Israel. Uh, thank you, South Lady. Uh, you have been doing wonderful work, uh, especially for the African community. Uh, bringing African students to a bigger platform like this is, has never been quite uh, an easy task, but you keep on working very hard, and I'm glad of you and what you do. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening, all our audience. Uh, so today we are here once again to talk about the employment-based second preference. That is where the name EB2 came from, employment-based second preference national interest waiver. So the NIW actually means National Interest Waiver. Uh, like my, uh, like Victor said, my name is Mr. Daniel. I represent also Charisma Immigration. Uh, it's a new registered company uh, based in Rochester, New York, uh, that we also provide immigration assistance to clients. So one way or the other, this is not new. Most of you might have come across EB2 and IW. But one thing I always do is to try and share my personal story because it's also may mirror some of you your own. Uh, like he said, I came from Ghana on F1 to study environmental science. Then I also pursued a second master's in sustainability science. And also 2018, as I was just finishing my master's, I was doing inquiries on NIW and of course also contacted some lawyers. And if you realize, I don't know whether it's USC is not doing a good job, NIW, the information you have there can be a bit deceptive. Uh, so I did a lot of research about this, did a lot of consultation on this kind of green card. And after a lot of lawyers declined my offer to take my case because I had one of the weakest profiles. Yes, I had one of the weakest profiles uh, concerning NIW. So if you are here and you are still waiting for publication and citations before you jump in, then uh, wahala for you. <laughs> so uh, I didn't have any citations. I didn't have any publication in the field. And after lawyers tell me that I decided to kind of go ahead and still file on my own. It was a risky move I took anyway, because I filed concurrently, uh, especially at a time that these were very current. The whole process took one year because even though I filed concurrently, after approval of the I-140, the I-485 also kept going through the system. And at some point, even they wanted to know whether I was still in school. So they sent an RFE for the I-45 to verify that whether I'm still in school doing environmental science research stuff. So uh, be careful how you plan leaving school. Immediately you file your I-140. Uh, so I also pursued immigration law studies right after getting my green card. I'm somebody that I really love and fancy immigration issues. And I've been helping people, even when I was in master's school, uh, helping people, whether, whether marriage-based or kind of different types of immigration stuff. So it is something that I really love doing. So I pursue an immigration courses with the Washington Tech and got a certified in immigration law specialist. Uh, so after that, I also started the Charisma LLC. And that's how come I've also been providing services to various group of people from different culture, cultural background. Yeah, so let's just look at the immigration law review. This may not be anything new to some of you. I just wanted to incorporate people who are probably for the first time hearing NIW because we all have to help ourselves and make sure that we understand the fundamentals of NIW. Uh, then we can have enough time. Today we have enough time for question and answers. Uh, that's after this, you may not even need a consultation because bring all the questions that you have or begin writing them down as the presentation is ongoing. Yeah, so if you look at it, the U.S. immigration is based on various uh, different categories. So that we have the employment based, which is I have termed as the EB, and also the family based green card, which is the FB. Of course, we have the DV lottery, where I know that most of Nigerians are kicked out of that lottery. So these are the basic fundamental uh, U.S. immigration green card uh, avenues. Now, we, for the purpose of this webinar, we are going to base on the EB, of course. We have the EB1C, and of course, the EB1C is for multinational uh, managers. So let's say you have a company in Canada, and your company wants to send you to the United States uh, as a manager. Of course, they can bring you through the EB1C and file a green card for you through that route. We have the EB1B, for instance, those in postdoctoral research, especially with academic research institutions. Uh, the EB1B is a very favorable route that universities can take to file a green card for you. 
Now the EB1A is also a first preference uh, kind of category where it's for uh, mostly also researchers who have kind of, it can be postdoc, it can be full-time professors, or uh, even those in professional field who, who have kind of built a, a very solid uh, professional uh, po a po a position or po professional picture for themselves. So that is the EB1A, the, the bar to meeting this EB1A can be really high. So it's not everybody that can qualify, although it allows for self-petitioning. Uh, now we come to EB2. EB2 is a second preference. And within the EB2 is what you have the NIW. So I always say that the NIW is not a separate class from the EB2, it's part of the EB2. But this EB2 is mostly used by companies to file regular green card for their employees. And as part of it, the NIW is used to self-petition. If you're not getting any company, to get a job offer to file that green card for you, you can use the NIW route to self-petition for your own green card. Then of course, we have the EB3. The EB3 is a little less like semi-skilled kind of uh, uh, category that uh, especially a lot of nurses try to use. So there is this kind of debate after, as to whether nurses can use EB2 or EB3. Uh, they can use both as a stance, but uh, you as a nurse, it depends on you for, because for a job to classify as at times for as EB2, it has to require uh, an advanced degree uh, or at minimum a bachelor's degree. And we all know that you can even do nursing job at times with an associate degree. That is where the bone of contention is coming from. But most nurses always find themselves going through the EB3 route, but that's why you need an employer to do that for you, just like the EB1C and EB1B. Now, the EB4, of course, is the juvenile visa, the religious visa, different categories of uh, special immigrant, we call it the special immigrant visa. That one also allows, of course, for self-petition. Uh, uh, and also the EB-5, the EB-5, of course, if you have 800,000 US dollars ready to cough to the US government and tell them that you're going to use this money to invest into the US economy, uh, of course, you are going to get, you can get an EB-5 uh, green card approved. So that is what I just wanted to bring across. Well, this slide may be very familiar to other people. The purpose of this meeting is to actually go over the requirements of EB2 and IW as it has not changed up to now. Uh, and also maybe one or two additional stops Then we allow, uh, we create room for questions. So it's important that we go through some of these things. So to apply for EB2 and IW, you need an advanced degree. The advanced degree, we shall come to that, what, know what an advanced degree is. And in addition to the advanced degree, you also have to satisfy a three-prong test. So it's not just a matter of me meeting, having an advanced degree, therefore I qualify and I deserve to get this green card. You are supposed to meet the three prong test. And what are the three prong tests? That the prong test one says that declare an endeavor. You have to state an endeavor. And this endeavor has to have a merit and a national interest. So declare a career title and let it have an importance and let it be of interest to the United States. Now the second prong test is that the applicant is well positioned to advance the individual. So what, what makes the applicant well positioned? We shall come to look at it. And the third prompt test is that on balance, are you more better than the ordinary United States citizen? Why should we bring you in whilst we have citizens in this same category who can do, who can do that job? That is where advocacy skills come in, trying to pair yourself as a better candidate than the ordinary US citizen. It's just like going for visa interview and they asking that what makes you a better candidate? That is just something like that. Now you ask yourself, do you have an advanced degree? Uh, do you have an advanced degree? It's a very straightforward question. Uh, so advanced degree is simply either you have a master's, a PhD, or a BSc plus five years of related work experience. Master's, PhD, or bachelor's degree plus five years of work experience. So whenever you are able to meet that threshold and you are starting your petition, you have to claim the fact that you are going the advanced degree route. Now, somebody will also ask, what if I don't have a bachelor's degree? Yes, this NIW is not only for people who have an advanced degree. You can also apply through something we call exception ability round. And I was telling somebody that, let's say you are in a trade occupation where mostly it doesn't even require a bachelor's degree, but you have been in this occupation, you have built a very good resume for yourself in this occupation. Of course, if you can convince the USCIS that you can meet the exception ability criteria, or you can equally also file for this. That's why it's no surprising at times you can find people in the entertainment industry and all other people also trying to use this uh, category. Uh, so take note of that. Now, what is prong test one? Of course, it says you have to declare an advance, uh, sorry, declare an endeavor. Now, the endeavor is something very simple. And you see, 
if you look at your resume, and Divya shouldn't necessarily be something you are currently doing. That is the misconception that people have that, okay, my title of what I'm applying should be just the same as what I'm just doing right now. No, just look at your CV in totality. And after looking at your CV, what does your CV portray you as? That is the Endivia. It's a career title. Okay, so for instance, you can say I'm applying to further the career as a climate scientist in the United States, or I am applying to further the career as public health expert in the United States. That sentence is very important. And we have five serious, uh, various cases of people coming with RFE where they didn't declare this kind of Endivia. Your entire petition is going to circulate around this endeavor. So make sure that as you are stating it, have in mind that anything you are going to say about your achievements actually is going to portray you as some something which is going to help you further this endeavor. So it's a career title you have to state and you have to declare it explicitly. Now, after that, you come to the merits. The merit is just the importance of the endeavor. Okay. So let's say you are somebody in the field of, let's say, climate science climate science researcher or in a field of, let's say, uh, mechanical engineering, automation engineering, or whatever it is. What is the importance of what you do? Of course, the officers know the importance of what you do. They know it. But according to U.S. immigration laws, the burden of proof lies on you, the applicant, not them. So you realize some people say, oh, okay, somebody in entertainment have gotten approved. Somebody in social science have gotten approved. And me doing very important research like this, I got denied. It's not about the importance of your field. When it comes to NIW, every field is important in the eyes of the visa officer. It's the person who has been able to prove his case and convince the officer is what get, who gets approval. So uh, take note of that. So the importance of what you do is what you call the merit. Then it comes to the national importance. How do you document national importance? So you see that from test one, it's not about you particularly. We have not come to you yet. We are on your field. Does it have an importance? Is it important in the United States? So how do you know that your field is important in the United States? Do a simple Google search. Is USCIS or, sorry, is any US agency doing something related to your field? Uh, it can be maybe for environmental science, EPA doing something. If you're in healthcare, maybe National Institute of Health doing something. Uh, if you're in climate science, maybe NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Sciences, uh, doing some experiments concerning your research. So these articles and reports are what you're going to use, analyze to prove that whatever you are doing, of course, it's of interest to the United States. If a major US government agency is supporting this or writing about this or publishing news about this, then of course it's in the United States uh, government's interest. Or let's say the White House is bringing certain Congress con congressional acts uh, to support this area. Of course, that can also be considered a national interest or even mainstream media. We know the issue at the Texas border right now. Let's say you are somebody doing migration and child trafficking kind of thing, or maybe you are doing something like uh, uh, people and migration and the social sciences. Of course, that news in the mainstream media concerning the Texas border crisis is also going to be your national interest. So you see, national interest is about picking some of these main news and analyzing them to show that these are going on in the US, therefore my field is very much important. And of course, the officer will also be glad to see that you go overboard beyond the borders of the United States and talk about certain global stuff concerning your work. So at times, two or three global interest kind of stuff will also do a very good job for you. And after that, uh, you also have to talk about the applicability. Applicability mostly is uh, how your various skills on your CV is going to support the national interest. Or if you're in research, how various research teams you are doing is supporting the overall national interest. Or if you are a professional working in corporate America, people always say that at times I try to use research kind of time. So let's say you are in corporate America, whatever job or corporate position you are, or whatever corporate achievements you have, how is going to actually support the bigger US interest is what we call the applicability, okay? And all these things come under prong test one. So take note of that. Now, then from there, we go to prong test two. Now, at prong test two, now the attention has shifted from your field. Now, let's look at you, the applicant. Are you well positioned? Okay. People actually have problem with this kind of term, well positioned. Well positioned means you should doesn't mean you should be the highest of highest on your field. Okay. What are some of the things you have achieved on your CV, which is positioning you to be able to advance this career, this endeavor you have selected? Maybe your previous work experience, maybe some certifications you have, maybe some memberships you have joined. Or uh, maybe some conferences you have been attending, maybe even some news written about you concerning your uh, contributions to the field. All these things are some of the things you can document as positioning you 
to be able to advance this career. So when you come to prong test two, the USCIS uh, website says that you must meet at least three, okay, of this criteria below. So that's three, uh, these things listed, the officer will make sure that you meet at least that threshold of three or more, okay? When I'm helping my clients, that's why I do uh, consultation. I try to go through various areas on things they, might, they have not even stated on their CV to make sure that we can even go beyond the three. I don't like resting on the three at, at all. I just want to go more or over it. Now, so let's look at the first criteria. Official academic record showing that you have a degree, diploma, certificate, or similar award from a college. So if you have a bachelor's degree, if you have a master's degree, which I presume most of 90% uh, or 95% of us on this platform have, then of course you can meet this criteria. Okay, so by default, a lot of people tend to meet this criteria without even knowing that they meet this. Now, at this moment, mostly this part will be a chapter three of your petition. The national interest, merit, and devia part becomes a chapter two. So right from that point, you descend to chapter three. So that your petition should have that flow. That chapter one, you just talk about advanced degree, that you have a master's or bachelor's, talk about that program you did, maybe a project you did, one project work or thesis work you did, and talk about the reputation of the university. Then you transition to chapter two, where you are talking about merit, national interest, global interest kind of things. Then you transition to chapter three, where at this point you are going to talk about the fact that you are well positioned by documenting at least three of these criteria that are listed. So at this point, when you are talking, you are going to talk about specific coursework you have taken, especially with criteria number one. Which coursework have you taken that has positioned you? And if you go on your transcript, there are a lot of courses you have taken. Just select five of them and write convincingly how these courses have given you skills to make you a professional in the field. The next criteria says letters documenting at least uh, 10 years experience. It's not mandatory that you should meet this. So if you're able to have all, tally all your work experience and they meet 10 years, that is very good, uh, good job. If it doesn't meet, it's not, not compulsory to try and force yourself to meet it. In so doing, maybe you try doing some kind of fraud activities that can land you into trouble. If you don't meet the 10 years, don't force yourself. There are a lot of other criteria you can try to do. Now, license to practice the profession or certification for your field. Yeah, let's say you don't, you couldn't even meet the second one. Let's look at the third one, license or certification. So this one is also very, at times, quite easy to meet depending on the kind of license you select. Some licensing may, uh, stretch a lot and try to, you have to learn for long hours before you take those exams. And people at times confuse certification with short courses. You see, uh, when you take a short course, maybe through Coursera or LinkedIn or through other uh, third party uh, uh, platform, it could be a professional development course. That doesn't make it a certification. Certifications are mostly given by professional body. For instance, Google, Amazon, career certifications, they qualify as certifications. Why? Because at times you have to study and learn and pass models to be able to get the certifications for yourself. So then you become, a, you get a certified designate, designatory, right? So you are being designated for maybe a particular skill. That is what we call certification. So most of the time, especially in environmental science, you can also talk about OSHA as a certification. Uh, in healthcare, HIPAA, HIPAA is a certification, uh, which you, if you have it, which is also very good. Uh, you can also talk about certified environmental engineer in training, if you're an environmental science or professional engineer certification. Some certifications are very easy to get, uh, which are some of them even require you to maybe take uh, maybe 10 hour credits, uh, kind of thing that you can, after 10 hours, you can take some exam and pass at a score and get that designation. So certifications, try and see your field to see which of the certification you can easily meet because this is time bound. You don't want to take a certification which is going to stretch you too much and even interrupt your professional or academic research. Now, evidence that you have commanded salary. This one is also very easy to meet, but people have misconception about it. Uh, salary doesn't necessarily have to be uh, 100,000 or high salary to prove that. This is different from the EB1A. EB1A requirement says that you should show at least a higher salary in the field. This law is not saying any, anything about higher salary. This law just says evidence that you have commanded salary relating to your exceptional ability. So whether you were paid 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 in whatever job you are doing, it's fine. People tend to at times underrate their work and salary from Nigeria, which is or other with their, our home country, which is not something I would advise because when I'm analyzing salary for you as a client, I look at a geographic location. Of course, you cannot compare Nigeria's salary to American salary. 
So in Nigeria, let's say in Nigeria, you are a manager of a particular uh, field. Uh, what was the typical salary of managers in Nigeria? Maybe even in Port Harcourt versus Abuja, there can be very variations, okay? So take note of that. Now, another thing is membership. Membership is also very easy. So if you come to me and you don't have membership on your CV, that's the first thing I'll just try and let you go and get. Uh, but I know that this one, a lot of people, it's very easy to get. Just find some association to join and pay their dues and let it seem like you are doing something, okay? So two or three memberships are going to help. Uh, so take note of that. Now, recognition for your achievements and significant contributions. This is also very broad, which a lot of, most of the time we can able to get other stuff to write out of this criteria to support whatever you are meeting in this criteria. And let us look at them. So what can you actually use to prove recognition or significant contribution? Of course, let's say in your graduate school, you were given some scholarships, you were given some fellowships, you were given some agency funding. You can use that. Or employee awards, maybe best performing employee or promoted to a particular uh, level from one level to another. Presentations, uh, uh, awards, let's say your best presenter, third place presenter, second place presenter. Maybe you have a patent, so it's not very much common, but if you have been able to have a patent or your name among a particular group of people who came out with a particular invention, it's also fine. Uh, public uh, Publication and citation. This is just one of it, which is maybe causing misconception in people's minds. There's never a strict criteria to meet. So if you have publication in the field and citation, we just write about maybe even five. Some of them may be having about 20 publications. We select about five of them and refer the officer to the, to the rest of the publication on the CV. At times, if you have a Google Scholar page, fine, we can print the entire Google Scholar page as an exhibit. Uh, so take note of that. Promotions, also recommendation letters. Some people have been saying that they do this without recommendation and it'd be just five for them. Uh, but for me, I try to let my clients try and get some recommendations, okay? So if nothing at all, three, four, five recommendations in the field, we can be able to do with it. Not submitting a recommendation at all, I wouldn't encourage that. Because even in graduate school, when you're applying, they want other people to talk about your character and uh, to attest to your performance. Okay, so how much more immigration that you want to stay in somebody's country permanently? So try and get some recommendation from people to support your application. Media publication about you and your projects. At time, do a Google search about yourself. Have any media written about you, you may not even know but maybe your lab have been written and your name have been written somewhere you can be able to find out. So all these things, abstracts, conference emails, when you attend a conference, the name tag, all of this serve as any evidence to purport you as uh, exceptional or a specialist in the field, okay? Uh, any research breakthrough you have made. So even your, your thesis, what did you come out with that you can actually write as a contribution that you have made in the industry? So people don't know this. When we do PhD research, there are a lot of thematic areas or questions we try to answer. Try and look at some of them and see how you can bring them here to say that this is what I found out and this is how it's going to help and benefit or move the United States in this sector or that sector. Yeah, technology transfer. Let's say your research is going to be used by other companies outside of your lab. It's also very good, especially if you're able to get your supervisor can mention some of these things, uh, it may be in a recommendation for you too, that is fine. Now, let me talk a bit about recommendation before I go to the next slide. Not no law compel you to take recommendation from your supervisor or your previous employer. So recommendation letter can be spread very wide, okay? So especially you can take some from Nigeria, you can take some from Ghana, you can take some from South Africa, take some from China. So far as the person writing for you have some kind of correlation with what you do, uh, for instance, nurse, public health, these people can actually write for each other or somebody in uh, electrical engineer uh, versus, uh, electronics, I think they are the same thing, electronics, electrical engineer, uh, maybe plus other electrical, allied electrical engineer field can also write for themselves. So it doesn't have to be strictly the field, but some allied field close to yours, maybe chemistry, biochemistry, something like that, yeah. So take note of that uh, when you are soliciting for recommendation letters. And the person who writing doesn't necessarily have to be a PhD holder. It can even be a bachelor's degree holder having about 10 years experience in the field. Of course, such a person also, qualifies to write for you. Then comes the prompt number three. Prompt number three, by default, most of the time, is not very difficult to satisfy uh, if you have been doing all this thing well. At prompt number three, you are only summarizing key achievements that you mentioned in uh, chapter three that are better positioning you better than the ordinary undergraduate US citizen. What do you, can you talk about? Let's say your master's uh, degree. You have advanced degree in the field. 
that ordinary undergraduate citizen uh, have uh, just a bachelor's degree. It's making you a better competitive professional than the US citizen. International exposure. Some people have lots of experience from Nigeria even before coming to the US and the field with that international perspective is going to make you a better positioning individual than the ordinary US citizen. A lot of things that you can write about that makes you better. Maybe IT skills you have, maybe some publications you have made in the field, if you have any. Uh, all of these things, you just do some kind of comparison to make some advocacy for yourself. That is why at this point, advocacy skills are going to be very important. Then, of course, you talk about consequences the US will suffer without your skills, OK? So if we don't have climate scientists, if we don't have environmental scientists, if we don't have wastewater treatment specialists, what are the consequences? Maybe US water bodies are going to be disrupted or polluted. Uh, maybe climate information will be scattered and uh, people relying on climate information for their work will actually suffer because of that knowledge gap. Uh, maybe you are in the field of supply chain. We are in COVID times. We all know the negative consequences of disrupted supply chain. Of course, these are some of the things you can be bringing up at this particular chapter. And when this chapter is done and well and done, that is when the officer can go ahead and approve your petition for you. Yeah, so you just think through some of these questions on the slide, and that actually is what uh, you can actually write concerning uh, consequences. Now, the summary model of it all is this one. This is what the officer follows to approve your green card, okay? Do you meet the advanced degree threshold, okay? So whether you meet it or you don't meet it, even if you don't meet it, are you able to satisfy that three exceptional ability criteria, okay? So somebody who doesn't have a bachelor's plus five years or master's or PAB, and applying towards exceptional ability, we we'll just go straight to chapter three, talking about those criteria that you can meet. Okay, so you see that it's, it's a way that you can just advocate for yourself for this green card. It shouldn't be that difficult. So don't just rely on publication and citations and fold your arms. And I have one person who say, well, I'm waiting for my article to collect citations. By the time you wait and wait and wait, uh, you will be, the visa numbers will retrogress to somewhere 10 years. Yeah, so please uh, take note of that. Now, from there, the officer look at the applicant. Have your field show merit and national interest? When that one is satisfied, he goes to the next one. Has the applicant shown that he's well positioned? Then finally, on balance, is he better than the ordinary US citizen? And at any point in time, if he's not satisfied, he just issue RFE for that, uh, for you to explain further. Okay, so I, I, I always advise applicants that when you are applying for this thing, even if you can apply on your own, which is good that we try to motivate people to do it on their own, get an expert to go through it for you. There are some RFEs that some people are bringing to me and this were totally avoidable, okay? So you realize that this one could have just been dealt with. Why do you sit down and let all these things degenerate into this particular moment? Yeah, so try and let an expert go through to it for you so that you know that you have really done a very good job and save yourself that three months of delay of RFE and also that uh, potential if you are denied, you have to be refiling again. Uh, if you are lucky, then of course that goes through. Yeah, so try and take note of that. And that is it. Now I want to end this slide and get away for question. Before that, there's whole news about priority days and retrogression. Uh, people don't know whatever it is, what it is. People don't know its implications on their own petition. Uh, so we try to, I try to bring this one to highlight a bit on it. So when we say priority date, it's not any kind of big term. It's just that, just see it this way. USCIS received your petition. Therefore, he has placed you on a queue. That's what it is. So the date that you receive, I receive your petition is the, the date you join the queue. So for instance, if your petition reached USCIS today, which today uh, is like 20 something, okay. And somebody's petition reached USCIS, let's say two days later. Of course, in the queue, you are having an earlier priority date than the person. Now, visa numbers were always current until there became a backlog. Uh, this is at 20, uh, the year 2020 when I was adjusting my status. This was the table. And currently 2023, this is how the table stands. So look at the two table. There have been drastic changes. And also, if you look at it very well, all chargeable areas except those listed, that one refers to the rest of the world, okay? These guys, China, mainland China, they are so much populated that they have even created a separate category for them. India, the same thing. Mexico, the same thing. Philippines, too, the same thing. At any point in time, any of these countries can be added to the rest of the world. As you can see from 2020, we have Vietnam, but right now Vietnam even have been added to the rest of the world, okay? So US, uh, US Department of State is in charge of this table and they declare how many visas US is going to give and how many people are waiting in line. This dynamics is like supply demand kind of thing. 
this dynamics is what actually sets the bid. So at any point in time, let's say demand is going low and they are bringing more visas out. Of course, then it's coming forward and it's becoming current. At any point in time, it's going to progress again. So if you look at it very well, you see that uh, currently we have our number standing at 15 February, 2022. What it means is that uh, those who submitted their petition on this date or before can right now file adjustment of status. That is what basically it means. So if your date is after this date, then of course you have to wait until it moves onto your range. That is what it means. But you realize that as of 2020, everything was current here. EB1A is current. Now EB1, EB1 is, have always been current for most of the time because a lot of people try to meet that and they have been falling away or they are one way or the other. But uh, with time, I don't know, with time, I don't know whether people actually don't know much about it or whether people are not actually subscribing for it. But with time, when they, I know a lot of Indians are trying to meet that because if you look at their table, it's even worse because right now their date for EB2 is somewhere around for India is like 2012. All right, so they are trying very hard. And even for EB1A, it's still now moved even to February 2022. So right now that means we are even lacking because Indians are trying to meet this date so that even when he's in the queue with this date, he can go to India and within short time, he can just get a green card compared to somebody here who is waiting for somewhere like 12 years to get a green card. So don't sit and wait for this to retrogress. Start doing something. Yeah, start doing something. Yeah, so on this note, I think this is where I'm going to bring uh, I'm going to bring out the curtain for this presentation so that I'll hand over it, uh, this presentation to the host to continue and maybe invite questions from the audience. Of course, I can't talk about everything. Maybe your questions are going to open a uh, path for conversation on other areas too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Daniel. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the very um, precise and clear um, presentation. So <clears throat> before we proceed, um, we have a few questions. We have questions on YouTube and we have questions here on, on Zoom that have been typed, but we'll give preference to those who are on Zoom for now, those who want to actually ask their questions in person via, via voice. So yeah, you can continue to raise your hands and uh, I will mention the names. And if possible, please, if it's possible, would like to see your face, um, show your face as you are answering the question. So right now we have Robert Obeifuna. Please go ahead and ask a question on mute and show video if possible. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Victor. I'm sorry I couldn't show my video because here I am. So um, I'm starting the U.S. New Jersey New um, Jersey to be precise. I'm a graduate student. I'm studying a uh, master's in communications and media. Um, so currently, I've been uh, worried about how to go about this. But thanks to this information that I'm just, I'm just you know, being privileged to get to know. So my question is one: um, supposedly, or uh, Probably something happened that your case is getting a constant denial. And somehow the EB1 NIW is no longer a route for you. Somehow uh, the family base, link card route, you know, happens to come in play for you in the future. Now, somehow you have shown in intent to stay in the narrative. Will you be affected? I mean, would that be would that affect you in the future? Like constant denial from the EB1 NIW. Didn't get it, and now you're not applying for green cards. You have family base. That's not one question. And secondly, applying for the EB1 NIW route does it require me to go back to Nigeria to issue the green card, or will I stay here in America? Green card. And then lastly, now I need to be very clear because I thought I was confused with regards to uh, the H1B. And the green card. I was thinking it would be it's a green card until it was so clear to me like it's not a green card because I have a passion of joining the US military, US Navy to be precise. So I, age is more or less no longer on my side. So the first time I get my green card, but to my dream, the better for me. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so this is how we're going to do it. We're going to take three questions each, three questions from people who are raising their hands, 
then we'll take three questions from YouTube, and then we'll take three questions from the chat here in, in on Zoom. So, um, Mr. Daniel, um, do you okay. want to help us address the question? Yeah, so uh, maybe you may come, want to come back with the first question he asked, but I remember he was talking about EB2. Does it require him to go to Nigeria or stay in America? Uh, so when you file EB2 and IW, I-140, it in itself is not the green card. There are two parts. You file the I-140, get approval, then of course you move on to the I-45, which is the adjustment of status when your days get current. Now, when you file an I-140 and get approval, uh, you can decide to go back to Nigeria and wait for your turn to come through a green card through consular processing. It's allowed. Or if you still want to stay in the United States, then you have to stay legally. You have to have a status. This is not like the green card through marriage or through a U.S. citizen relative. With this one, you need a status. You need a legal stay to be able to get it. So if you stay in the United States, of course, then either you are in school or you are on H-1B or you are on a particular, some type of visa, uh, of course, which you don't want to, you don't even want to have even a one week of out of status. With this one, it's a very strict and stringent kind of process. It came to a time that we are we are going for interview, and the interview they want to really know that not even on a single day that you have violated your status or go out of status. So please take note of that. Uh, so also H one B as I, I if I got a question right, I said H one B and a green card. How does it play along? Uh, so under normal circumstance, an employer will file an EB two for you after you have been on H one B for some time. That's one thing I've realized with U.S. companies. You they bring you an OPT. After OPT, they try and put you in a lottery for H-1B. H-1B allow you to stay in the U.S. for up to six years. After six years, uh, of course, you have to depart uh, the United States if you are not, uh, if your employer have not gone through a green card process for you. So what happens is that with an approved I-140 from NIW, you can go over the six year unlimited. That is what the, one importance of I-140, even if the days are not current. You can continue even moving from H-1B job to another H-1B job and going with your I-140, uh, provided you don't leave the field. The moment you leave that field, you got your I-140 in to go and do a different job altogether, that messes up the whole thing. So that is one thing that I, I can also say about the H-1B and the EB-2 NIW. Uh, with the first question, maybe I'll need clarity on that because the voice wasn't that clear, but I hope the question has been answered. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, to give clarity on my first question, I said, um, um, upon granting, uh, upon the embassy, I mean, the embassy giving me a visa, an F1 visa, part of the agreement was made is an back to my country after my studies. Now, being in the US, I have declared intent to stay back in the US by applying for EB2 NIW, right? Mm -hmm. And by chance, let's say by chance, this is not this is not what we hope for, but by chance or something happened that I keep getting a constant denial, you know, for the NIW. And later tomorrow I happen to like one now one thirty five via family based green card. Will it affect me? Like if my previous if my previous record of showing an intent to stay back, will it affect me? Like will I be seen as someone who is desperate? Or will I be, you know, because these are like cases, you know. Okay, all right. Yeah, I get a question right now. Yeah, so the US can be very generous when it comes to green card, uh, pursuing green card. There is no law which restricts you from getting only one type of green card. So let's say you did EB to NIW, it got backfired and you didn't get go through. Uh, later, if you're applying for marriage based green card, it's allowed. I know people have clients who are on asylum and they are still pursuing EB to NIW. Okay, so uh, one denial of green card doesn't affect you from getting a family-based green card. They don't cross in any way. Just that when you are filling the form and you are asked whether you have filed an immigrant petition before, just answer honestly and see yes, you have done before. Yeah, so that's the only thing you do, but it's not going to cross over to affect your other type of green card you want to pursue. Okay. Thank you very much. So I think the next person is um, Okiki Quadri. Kindly unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, thank you for the opportunity. So my question is, uh, I just finished my master's degree. Can I start the NIW instantly 
or should I wait till I get into my PhD program to file? Secondly, I have a family back home. I'm trying to bring them in on F2. Do I have to include them in my NIW application right now? Or will I have to wait till I get mine before, uh, uh, before telling them to come or I can do it concurrently? And the last question is, if I do not have, like you said, uh, citation is not essential in the application process, but like how many reference do you think is enough for a good application, uh, application for the filing? So those are my three questions. Okay, so number of reference. So with number of reference, uh, there's no set number that you have to submit in support of your application, okay? Some do five, four, six, eight, but I've seen a trend that the weaker your case, the more reference you want to submit, okay? I remember during my time, uh, I was very much uh, kind of uh, scared that, I, okay, let me see, let me su submit seven. I even collected nine recommendation letters, but I ended up sending seven because I thought nine was just too much. Uh, of late, I've seen people doing just four or five and it's been just fine, okay? So there's no set number. So just always, we say that five is key, right? So try and do five or four and I think you should be fine. And concerning the fact that you have a family and you are thinking of filing this thing. Uh, so this is what I'm going to tell you. When you are filing I-140, you are going to fill a form mentioning your family's uh, putting dependence on this form. Now, USCIS get this form, of course, it gets into the system, okay? So if you have any aim of bringing your family in, bring them in first before you mail your petition to USCIS. That doesn't mean you are going to sit down and wait until they come in before you start drafting. Drafting a petition takes time. At times, I know that I have some help that I'm able to go faster. Some lawyer can take your case and it can lie down for about five months before they mail it, okay? So you don't want to be waiting for that long time. Try and draft everything and make it ready, like for instance, those on B1, B2 who are trying to come in through Vista Visa uh, when the days were special was current, uh, they will do everything ready, come inside, and after staying maybe five months in the US, they just mail their petition and then they stay. Because once you have a pending uh, I-485, it's considered a status. So that is some of the tricks that you may want to use. You don't want to mail to USCIS, they get all their names on this petition. Then of course, when they are going for Visa interview, it becomes a problem. You can let them come in first. Then of course, you can mail your petition to them. Now, concerning the fact that you are finishing master's, you are going to a PhD, I've, I started working on my petition when at the time that I was finishing my master's. In my first year of a PhD, that is when I submitted a petition. Uh, and of course, when I was in the first year, when everything got approved, I just left the lab to do something that I'm happy in doing. Yeah, so that is something that you don't, nothing mandates that it should be a PhD program before you file an NIW. Okay, so I hope I've answered your question. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Um, then we'll ask the last question from Zoom for now. Um, I think either Chukwe Mikaduru or Chika Kalistus. I'm not sure who came first. I came first too. Hello? Oh. This <laughs> okay. okay, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> go ahead, sir. <laughs> Yeah, all right. And um, thank you very much for the presentation. I just have one question, and I'm very brief, so somebody else can ask if the opportunity is there. What is the ratio of um, dependent and independent recommendation letters? I'm filing my case, and I want to use four um, um, recommenders. So can I use three? If I have three dependent and one independent, can that work? Or do I have to have three independent and then one dependent? I'm filing with a lawyer, and the lawyer is saying that I must have three independents and then one dependent. So I just want to know the ratio. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, there is not actually a set ratio for this, okay? But I always say that balance it, okay? If you are turning in five recommendation letters, three dependents, two independents, or two, uh, three independent, uh, independents, two dependents, it's fine, okay? Try and balance it. Three to one looks more skewed, okay? So if you are submitting four, you can do two, two. It's just fine, okay? Yeah, so we'll make sure that they are kind of a bit balanced somehow. Okay, okay, thank you. And sorry, for, for, for a dependent, like if I have a professor who was in my university, like in Nigeria, when I was in Nigeria, if I have like two professors who do not know me, 
They have not supervised me. I've not worked with them. We've not published before. Can they serve as independent recommenders? Yes, sure. So independent recommender is somebody who have not have a working relationship with you. Not somebody who doesn't know you. Of course, how can somebody who doesn't know you even write? Yeah, so for instance, the professor knew you in the university, knew you that you were doing this research with maybe a colleague professor. Yeah. And that professor per se have not actually worked on any project with you. Of course, that professor then becomes an independent. Wow. And when I was filing mine, I had a case like that where in the same lab that I do my research, there was another microbiology professor. And whatever environmental research I was doing, there was a microbiology aspect. So mm. we share the same lab with this professor, but though he has not supervised me or done any project with me, but he saw me doing research most of the time. Mm. And this professor became an independent one for me. Okay, so it's totally allowed. Independent yeah. means the person know you by your skill, maybe mm. through LinkedIn, maybe through even a conference that he met you, but mm. he knows that, okay, this person, this is what he do, and this is his skills. That's okay. independent. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you very much. So we go to YouTube now. Um, so Joy Jibs asked, please, what's the certification for public health? So you mentioned that people can join some, people can get some certifications. So she's asking, or he or she's asking, what are some certifications for public health? The second question he or she has is, does joining Honor Society count in favor of association memberships? Um, then, so let me, okay, don't worry. Can you answer those two questions, please? So certifications for public health and honor society, Mr. Daniel. Okay, so joining honor society. Uh, so does it count towards uh, membership? So honor society, it depends on that society. What do they do? Uh, what are their core mandates? That is why when you are writing under membership, you take at least the first three sentences talking about the reputation of the association. What are, the, what are some of the things they do? And how do they even accept people into membership? It's not good to say, oh, I just paid money and became their member. Uh, it's good that you write something good about how these associations accept people in and what are their core mandate that they do. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, maybe whatever they are doing should strictly be your field, but it could be that maybe they are even supporting certain uh, public health related projects somehow, or they are supporting some academic research somehow and also in public health. Uh, of course, you can also write as something that you can also add as a, what, a membership. Uh, but membership, bear in mind that you don't have to just submit only one membership. When you are doing this thing, try and, because beside the fact that the officer sees that you have met this criteria, he also weighs the quantity of things you are submitting. So if it's membership, just don't join one. Try and do two or three. If it's certification, just don't try and do only one certification. Try to see if you can add maybe another to make it two, okay? Two is good. One is at times some way. Yeah, so that's something that I can tell you. When it comes to public health education, uh, I myself, I don't, I can't keep track of all the list of certification, but I think if you do a very Google, great Google search, uh, it can be able to give you some certifications in your field. Uh, at times too, yeah, if I have clients in those areas, I can look into their file and say, okay, this client joined this one. Maybe you can also join it. Uh, that at times also helps, yeah. All right. Thank you very much, sir. So I'm going to combine like two or three questions. So Mr. Okiki Kwaja already asked, but there's a question he didn't ask, which is, does CGPA matter when one file? So that's one question. Then on YouTube, Sarah Majin asked a similar question to what was asked before. I am currently pursuing a master's in biomedical engineering. Spring will be my last semester. When is the best time to start this process? So those are the two questions, Mr. Daniel. Okay, so when is the best time uh, to start this process? Uh, spring, uh, this is going to be your last semester. So one thing we always tell people is that EB2 is best started even from the onset of your master's. Last time we were saying that even if some of us, we got this information earlier, we will have at living filed even before we, we finished our master's because we didn't have this information. We didn't actually have the core knowledge of what this thing was actually entailing. So every the earliest the better that's what i always say the earliest the better because putting the petition together itself is a herculean task and you may want to start early so you finishing your masters try and put it together by the time of course after your masters biomedical science or biomedical engineering is a stem field you go into your opt and everything by i found for clients who are who are currently on opt so it's doable to do it once you are finishing your masters 
Now, they, of course, you are going to need your master's certificate. So you can't mail it to USCIS without adding your master's degree certificate. So even if you, you finish drafting early, you have to wait till you graduate and get your certificate and add it to your packet. Uh, that is what you should know. Now, does GPA matter? Of course, GPA doesn't play any role here. Yeah. So whether you have first class, second class, magna cum laude, laude, or whatever it is, third class, the important thing is that you have the bachelor's degree and you have taken courses in the field. That's the important thing. Thank you very much, Mr. Daniel. So I take one last question from YouTube. Um, so Samuel Uche, um, I have over eight years experience as a girl child advocate with an NGO to my name and projects of sustainable impact to girls in Nigeria. Also, I am currently pursuing my PhD in oh, computer science. How can I merge two of these? How can I merge two of these to my application? Well, girl child advocates, more of like social science field and PhD in computer <clears throat> science. Okay. So because at any point in time, you're going to declare an individual. So look at your CV right now. Uh, where do you think you stand? It's not about which field is having merit or national interest. Because in the eyes of the USCIS, every field has national interest. So you are supposed to decide which way should I go that I can get a lot to write about. In the course of filing, maybe you can opt for the computer science that you are doing, maybe any specialized research you are doing with computer science. And maybe as part of maybe a voluntary or social uh volunteering uh, work you can also mention that you are volunteer to pursue girl child advocacy rights or whatever it is it's allowed okay so you can be able to bring in that your child a girl child uh, advocacy work that you did with ngo as a social voluntary kind of work that you did to make sure that you encourage girl child protection or girl child advocacy kind of thing uh but actually your main core and devia you select you have to state it and maybe you stick to it and work your certifications and membership towards it. It's very much important. All right. Thank you very much. Um, then finally, I want to ask some questions from the Zoom, the Zoom chats here. Uh, just give me a minute. To then yes. Mujib Jimo asked, I just got my master's degree. I also recently got an offer as an assistant professor outside the US. Do you advise I stay in the US throughout the filing and decision process? Or can I submit my NIW and leave to take up the job pending the decision? Did you get the question, sir? I got it, yeah. So he currently have a master's degree and got an assistant professor job outside the US. So, like I said, when you file an I-140, it's not mandatory you stay in the U.S. You can go out of the U.S. while you wait for it. But you ask yourself, as you are going out of the U.S., are you going to come back? And do you have a visa to come back? Okay? So, if you are going to need a visa to come back, then, of course, filing this one, you may want to get your visa first, everything handled, before you file and leave. Okay? So, that when you are coming back, I was saying that going for consular processing, for visa is different from coming to a port of entry. I would say port of entry, they are a bit liberal with having a pending I-140, but with consular processing, it can also be a bit tricky, okay? Because we all know from back home, when you are going for student visa, it's not guaranteed. Same should it not be guaranteed when you are going for renewal or when you are getting a new visa, okay? So you filing this one and going for a visa or leaving the US and with the hope that you enter again, get your visa, you can go and do your professor, assistant professor outside the US job that you want to do. And whenever everything is current and you think you want to adjust status, you can just go through consular processing. Or if you have a visa at that time to enter, you can just enter and do adjustment of status. Okay. Yeah. So it shouldn't affect you in any way at all. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Olayomi Adams from the Zoom chat. Hello, thanks for the opportunity of this insightful webinar. I'm currently in an MBA slash information systems program, and I, I have been working on new technologies alongside faculties to advance the US economy. How do I qualify? Okay, so you are currently in an MBA and Infosys uh, degree. Uh, do you have a prior master's degree? Uh, or if you have a bachelor's degree, uh, are you meeting a, that five-year work experience threshold? It's important. Recently, the client that I got approved in cloud engineering or cloud computing, yeah, so actually had a bachelor's degree plus six years experience. So 
you want to weigh, are you going to use your master's to apply or you want to apply with a bachelor's degree, maybe with a work experience from Nigeria or work experience that you have accumulated here? Uh, it's the decision you have to ask yourself. So that is what is important. And ask yourself whether you meet the criteria for well position that I've talked about. When it comes to the well position aspect, it's a profile you can always build. You can always be joining an association. You can always be pursuing some certification. Uh, look at some of the things you can easily meet and add them to your CV, and I think you'll be good to go. Thank you very much, sir. And I think we'll take a final question from Zoom, um, the Zoom chat. So the question is by Joan, must the media publication about my lab project contain my name? Yes, so that's a very good question. I remember when I was filing mine, my professor used to invite some lab people, university news department even to come to our lab and interview us about our research. And some of these news were on the internet and I realized that my name wasn't there. So what was the smart thing I did? Uh, I have to get a recommendation letter from my supervisor. Of course, at that time I had finished with my master's. My PhD supervisor, I didn't want to include her because that was my first year of PhD. I was even trying to find my thoughts. So with my master's degree supervisor, at least I've done with him. So he was good enough to write for me. And he wrote that I'm the one who carry at least 80% of the research. So with that statement alone on the recommendation, you just quote it in the petition and that makes the news about you. Yeah, so even if your name is not mentioned, that's where recommendation letter will come to add credence to it. Thank you very much, thank you. Okay, so we can return to the Zoom chats, the audio video people now. Um, please remind me, I think Chukwu Emeka Duru, have you asked your yeah, question? I've not asked. Okay, can you unmute and show your video if possible? All right, so. can you show video? Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, my audible. Yes, we can hear you, yes. Okay, my questions are, um, I intend filing for the I-140, but I was advised to put a host to it until my wife goes for F1 visa interview that in my heart her chances. And F1 or F2? Sorry, let me F1, 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 okay. Uh, that in my heart her chances that I rather um oh they are, they petition after she gets in. So I was wondering if that's correct. And then the second question is my visa expires on January next year. And I intend going back to Nigeria after filing the I-140. Would would that constitute um, a denial for renewal of my visa if I do that? Or should I rather just stay here and wait? Or yeah, so when it comes to visa denial, nobody will say for sure that you'll be denied and nobody is going to say for sure that you'll be, you will be approved. Even lawyers will not tell you that. Because visa denial depends on the consular officer. You see, uh, in the case of your wife, when you put your wife on this petition, it is not your wife who filed. You filed and named her. So it's very unfair for the visa officer to use that against her. It, it is just something like maybe you have a US parents who are citizens and they file I-130 for you as maybe a relative to a US citizen. We have parents who might have filed and moreover, maybe you are out above 21 years, so you are in a queue. Does that mean when you are going for F1 visa, the officer should use that against you? No, okay? So your wife's case may be different, but even with that, he, she may be asked if an immigrant petition has been filed for her or not. That is where she can, at that point, it is not mandatory for her to say that, oh, I have filed this because she didn't file it. No law hold her to that because it could be that you filed and you added her with even on her blind side, who knows, okay? So it depends on how smart you handle that situation at the consular office. But the moment you, for you yourself, the petitioner going to renew, uh, of course, it's going to ask whether you have been asked or you have been filed for you, a, a petition has been filed in your name. And since you filed it, of course, you have to be very honest about it because no, understand that they have some of this information. It's a one agency, they share information. Even US and Australia, US and UK, they are sharing information. So there's no point to lie. What I'll tell you is that get your visa in the safe way. Let your wife also get the visa, go in an attempt and try it. And after that, mail your petition to USCIS. When the petition is already done and you have not mailed it to USCIS, they don't have any clear of your information about it. But the moment you mail it to USCIS and get a priority date, uh, of course, they're going to be in their system. And at that point, of course, it depends on how 
I have seen interviews where even the officer will not go that extent of asking those questions, but really want to see that your I-20 is genuine. You came to the U.S. and say you are come to study and you are actually in school. And that is what they bother themselves much about. But whatever it is, just play a safe game and try and get your renewal before you ship your, uh, your petition to the USCIS. Thank you very much. Um, so who is the next person? Thank you, Mr. Ahmed, right? All right, Mr. Ahmed, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for enlightening uh, some of us about it, right? So I, I'll just speak about my case. I am pursuing my MBA. I have a bachelor's degree. I'd work in renewable energy, right? Which I believe the US is taking very seriously. Yes. I have uh, four years renewable energy experience and utility energy, that's utility skill, electrical power systems. Mm -hmm. I had three years before com coming for my MBA. I have a PMP as well. So I want to know, do the sort of profile, does it look like something that I can find? I don't have a master's before. I have a PMP, right? And then when you were mentioning some other certification and the like, I was just thinking about some other things I can do. What chance do someone like me have in that kind of case? So if I look at it critically, you have four years in uh, of experience in renewable energy. Yeah. And three years in electrical power systems, right? Yeah, yeah. and they're very good. Yeah, they're in the entire energy circles, you have seven years experience. Yes. And of course, with a bachelor's degree, of course, you can meet the advanced degree criteria, okay? okay. And go through the list of things I said for exceptional ability, uh, well positioned, especially that prong number two, and add certifications, try and add some, I think you are having a PMP, right? Yes. Uh, which is more of like a certification. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, just uh, having that, and maybe if you can get maybe some quick, easy to get maybe energy related certification, you can add it, make it too. And maybe of course, join some membership. Membership is easy to join at times. So try and find some two members, memberships to join. And I think it should be good. Of course, evidence that you have commanded salary, you didn't work for free, you got paid. Mm -hmm. yes, so of course, you're also going to need pay stars to meet that. And once you're able to meet that three threshold or four, uh, which is good, I always end for four, which I think you'll be good to go, right? Okay. And then what of the opportunity of the MBA? Can it have an impact? Yeah, so the MBA is, itself is an advanced degree, okay? So okay. I don't know when you are going to graduate with your MBA. Next yeah. year, May. Yeah, so if you add the MBA, MBA itself is interdisciplinary. It can cut across a lot of disciplines. It's mm -hmm. not just for managing a business. It can be a business of renewable energy or, or every area that you have, the MBA is applicable. If you get your MBA, of course, it's also going to add to your credentials. One thing with EB2 and IW is that any credentials is accepted, okay? Uh, the more the credentials is pushing your profile, the better. That doesn't mean it's required for you to finish your MBA before you can file. You can file with a bachelor's plus, that's seven years you have. Or if you still want to finish and get your MBA and add it to boost your confidence, the more fine you can do that. But like I said, I have somebody who got approved with bachelor's plus six years experience. So nothing shows that compulsory you should finish your master's before you file, okay? Oh. Then the, the other one, uh, just to ask this one, which is since like the last one, during the time of filing, right? Let's say I file now and uh, let's say I'm on OPT during the process when you, it seems it takes some time, the way I've looked at it, maybe up to a year. Will I be able to, uh, I mean, maybe bring when my, let's say my wife is here and then we should be able to work that time or we need to wait till the, all process is done before yeah, working. Yeah, like like after the filing. Filing. So yeah. when days were current, you could have filed concurrently. Concurrently means filing adjustment of status and filing the petition together, which is what I did because I did that so that my wife can get work authorization to work. But you know that when wives come and they are on F2, a whole lot of depression and other things begins to set in. But right now, as days are retrogressed, the I-147 will not give the privilege to work. Okay. Yeah, so that is one thing I don't know why America does that because Canada allow their spouses to work. Uh, America F2, they say you have to stay home. So working right, actually, I don't see it being given right now until you file the I-485, which comes with work authorization. 
Okay. Then the last one. Sorry, everyone. Oh, um, I don't know. Do you will you drop your contacts on how to reach out to you after? The oh yeah. So I'm in the EV two NIW group and the uh, the documents that sort lady uploaded on the drive. My contact and my everything is on it. So if you look at the Google Drive EV two NIW documents in the EV two NIW group, my contact is there. Okay, I don't have that group, but I'll reach out. Yeah, to we will we will get back to you. Um, so okay. if you desire to be added to the group, we're going to send out a Google form link now. And you can type in your name and your phone number, and then we can add you to the WhatsApp group. Okay, thank you. Yes. So before we continue, so from our WhatsApp group, let me just quickly ask this question before we move on to the next person here on Zoom. So there's a question. Hi everyone, I have a question. Is it true that at the point of change of status in the US, USCIS checks the person's record to the extent of what he or she filed in the initial DS-160 and they used to move and what they used to move to the US. So for instance, if the person filed that they are single in DS-160, when in truth they are married, <laughs> do they really dig that deep and that far? What if the person got married during their program? So I think it's a complex question. Okay, yeah. So uh, of course, whenever you are seeking permanent residence in the US, it's very comprehensive background checks go on, okay? Not only that, even wherever you have worked, it goes on. I know people who were Indians and they were at that time filing, going through visa interview for adjustment of status. And it came up that they were doing this Amway kind of thing, this Amway online selling kind of thing. And they thought that it was very much not anything harmful, but they were earning income on that. And of course, based on that, they were denied. Okay. So any information you have on 160, of course, they are going to have access to it. It's fine that you came in as a single person in the course of your program, you got married. People's life changes all the time. But no matter what it is, let it be truthful that, of course, in the course of your program, you got married. Now, how you got married is another issue because America hardly accepts marriage by proxy. Let's say you have been here and they got married for you home and somebody represented. They don't accept that because they think that for marriage to happen, two parties must be present, okay, under a competent uh, uh, court of jurisdiction where they can certify that they have been married. So it could be that in the course of your program, you travel home and got married. That should be legit and that should be accepted with a very good marriage certificate. So it doesn't hurt that you came in singly, but at the time of filing, you are married. It doesn't hurt at all. Now, where the problem is that when you file I-485 as a single person, and after approval, let's say, sorry, I-140 as a single person, and after approval, you are trying to add a partner to it. At that point, the partner will not be allowed to add it because the partner will have to go through a family base, uh, like spouse of a green card holder kind of thing, because you didn't add her in the first place. So it's very much important that if you have a spouse, add your spouse to the I-140. Otherwise, you will have to some way, somehow, let her go through the family-based route. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> um, we would, who is the next person? Yeah, I think I am. All right, please go ahead, Mr. Joshua. All right, thank you, Mr. Daniel. Um, quick question, number one, is there any pro and cons for using the express application process i've heard people say oh you could pay um some amount of money and your application could be processed faster is there any pro and cons to that second question um can i state that i wish to start a business around my endeavor because that's one of the things i'm looking at then third question um does a previous j1 visa have an effect on eb2 niw i've been in the us um before for one year on a sponsored program by the United, um, by the um, US Department of State on a J-1 visa for one year. After which I returned to Nigeria, I completed my two years, uh, you know, um, post-country stuff. Then I came back for my MBA program, which I graduated last week. So does that have any negative effect on applying for NIW? And the last one is you mentioned that um, someone that has dependents should apply, should include their name in the, you mentioned, um, I-940 and I-45. So I just need a clarification on that, like so that they could get their work authorization right on time instead of waiting um, till you get approved. Thank you. Okay, so first thing I'm going to tackle is the pros and cons of premium processing. So 
there is not any benefit, neither is there any harmful effect of filing premium processor. When you file premium, the benefit you get is that you're going to get a decision at least in the first two weeks. Okay. To some, they think that it's worth it paying 2,500 US dollars to just clear their mind of getting the approval. That is their money. I can't advise towards against it. But at times, I look at the economic side of things that if you file an I've, uh, premium position right now, premium petition, and get decision in two weeks, and I wait three months later, I get my decision through the normal processing time. And then we all have an approved decision, okay? Nobody is going higher than the other person. Filing premium, premium doesn't put you ahead of the priority dates. Your priority date is when you mailed your petition to the UFCI, not when you got a decision. So rushing to pay premium to get a decision, actually at this moment, is not economically beneficial. That's what I see. But for the sake of clearing your mind and being okay that your petition has been approved, if it's something that you want to do, then of course you can also go ahead and do it. Now, concerning uh, starting a business, of course, yes. Thank you for bringing this question. So starting a business is an entrepreneurial form of EB2 and IW, okay? When you are filing EB2 and IW, it's very fine to file as coming in to work in corporate America, okay? But the moment you say you want to start a business, it's going to create a whole kind of, kind of worms, open a whole kind of worms. Why? The officer will want to be asking, do you have any business plan you have added? What is the initial financial capital you are going to inject in this business? How many American citizens are going to employ? Okay. And what is the overall national benefit of your endeavor? So when you are filing as planning to open a business, you are filing as an entrepreneur. It's not different from the normal NIW, but this time around, you are going to include more of like a business plan and also economic uh, projections and all those things. I don't do business plan kind of thing. If you can pay extra money to get that outside, fine, you can go that route and include as what your endeavor of creating a business to employ US citizens. Yeah, and of course, your financial situation also can be tricky, will be tricky into consideration. But remember, they have EB-5 visa, the investor visa. So if you don't ready to pay 10,000 and you want just an NIW, still the officer wants to see that you have that capability financially to open. Though not a lot of money like the EB-5, but you can also start a business with zero dollars. Of course, you have to show something. So it's something you want to think about. Now, previous J-1 visa, now is it going to affect NIW? Now with J-1 visa, you did it and you went back home, right? Yeah, so if you went back home and you have come back as to, for true normal school, I believe that you have you are cleared of that home residency rule if it applied to you some way, somehow. So with that one, I don't think it should affect you in any way. Now those who are currently on J-1 can even still file an idol. By that sense, they have to see for a waiver, okay? They have to apply for a waiver. And some people get waiver, some people don't get it, depending on the agreement between their government and the U.S. government. Let's say you have in the J-1 sponsored by the U Nigerian government, it could mandate you to come home. At the time getting a waiver can be very difficult, unless the Nigerian government grants you a release letter, okay? Yeah, but setting J-1 programs, you can easily also get a, a waiver. So take notes. Now, I-140 and I-485, you want dependents to come in, and when are they going to work and whatever it is. Like I said, I-140 doesn't give a work rights, okay? So when your dependents come in, uh, they are still going to be on F2, and they are not going to have a working right until your dates get current for you to file I-485. The I adjustment of status form is what allow you to add work authorization. It's what allow you to add travel authorization. That's what's called advanced parole. It's what allows you even to apply for social security. So when you are applying for an AI adjustment of status, there are even areas you can take that are uh, the that the uh, social security administration should give you a social security number, okay? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Joshua. Um, so I think we would quickly go back to the questions on YouTube. Um, we have about roughly 30 minutes left. So thank we try to make enough time for questions and answers. Um, so I'm going back to the questions on YouTube. So someone said, if you don't have a lot of papers and a lawyer has rejected your case, should you, sh should you still try or wait to get papers? Rachel Josephs asked this on YouTube. Okay, so uh, yeah, sorry for the background, for the alarm beeping. All right, so uh, if you don't have papers, one thing I've seen with lawyers is that 
uh, they always want more publications and more citations. Okay, so if you don't have the papers, look at the webinar we have done. We mentioned publication like one percent of it. It's not a strict requirement. Okay, so look at your profile right now. Do you meet the advanced degree? Can you satisfy at least three of the criteria that I mentioned for well positioned? These are what you are supposed to be asking yourself. And if you're able to meet this, don't wait for publication. Let me tell you, I filed my own when I, I only filed it with my master's thesis. If you check me on Google Scholar right now, it's only my master's thesis that was just there. And I've even seen somebody who have even filed and gotten a, a EB1A approved, even without also citations also. So don't be deceived by this. Don't fall in the citation publication trap. Uh, it will delay you because you can't even force people to cite your work. Okay, so build your profile around areas you can meet based on the criteria. I've given you the laws that USCIS officers are looking at. Publication is good if you have it. If you don't have it, it's not compulsory. Look at those you can meet and satisfy. Lawyers will turn you down. Victoria Chen turned me down. Ellis Porter Chen turned me down. Another one more lawyer, I don't want to kind of, I don't know, I can't remember, also turned me down. Doesn't mean they are not good. They have their criteria that we want people with publication and citations. But in my own way and whatever I'm doing, I've also gotten a lot of people approved that even none of them have come to me with publication and citations. It's recently that I'm getting some PAD clients who have some eight publication and some 13 citations. But most of my approvals on my website, all of them were zero citations. And some of them even no publication, especially some on OPT. Some of them, because I understand it this way that the officer is interested in one, your advanced degree. Two, the three-pronged test. Does it have merit, national interest, and global interest? Then uh, the second one, are you well positioned through all the things that I mentioned? Which, of course, if you have publication, you can add it. But if you don't have it, it's not compulsory. So you are the best judge for your own profile. If you know your profile is weak at some point, based on membership and certifications, try and uh, kind of top it up. Build a profile up, and you'll be able to go. Don't be waiting for publication and citation. Thank you very much. So we are going to read some other questions. Um, um, on YouTube, we have a very, very interesting one by Neka Ukoha. My mom has a PhD in educational management from Nigeria, currently retired. She is 62. She focuses on girl child education. Is she too old to file for NIW? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I believe you're asking from the perspective of Canadian immigration. Yes, Canadians add uh, age limit to their immigration. By US, even if you are 80 years and you want to immigrate, so far as you have met the requirements and you have been approved, you can immigrate. Okay. Yeah, so she can still better still uh, immigrate. It doesn't hurt at all. Thank you very much. And then, so I want to quickly run through the YouTube questions because I, um, it's faster. They are faster to answer. So. Okay, Joan asked, must I have a five years experience even with a master's degree? I think the answer to that is no, right, Mr. No, Daniel? No, no, yeah, but master's and degree, you don't need to meet the five year requirement. Yeah, the same question, Eric Paul, how many years of work experience is needed for a master's degree holder? Yeah, I don't think you need any year of experience. Um, so someone you said- don't need any experience. If you have some, it's good, but you don't still need work experience for master's degree. Good. Then Olonuma Yeulua Tosin asked, if I overstay my visa in the US, United States, can I still apply and I have a PhD? Okay, mm -hmm. you have overstayed. So overstayed your visa means maybe you are going out of status or you are out of status. Unfortunately, out of status, the only way you can get a green card is through marriage to a US citizen. Uh, if you're out of status, you can't do an IW. Okay. All right. Um, let me let me just run through all the YouTube ones because we may not have enough time to go back to them. Someone said, "Please, what do you advise an F two that got admission and is willing to change their visa to F one? Do you advise to go to Mexico or Nigeria for their interview?" We are not going to answer that here. Sorry, we are just talking strictly about NIW EB two. So if you have those questions, you can join our WhatsApp group. We can talk about that later. Um. Can someone with an MBA, Mariam asked, use that as a higher degree whilst he or she is currently undergoing a PhD in mechanical engineering? So I want to think the answer to that is yes, yeah. but I will allow Mr. Daniel to 
Yeah, it's, MBA is allowed. It's a master's degree. So it's, I it's, think the problem is the person is now going for mechanical engineering a PhD. So I, I think probably Miriam is worried about how to yeah, okay. Okay, I merge the story. Is like so how MBA, MBA is an advanced degree, but like I said, it's multi. I do miss just oh, are you here? Hello. Oh, okay, we need to mute this person. Sorry. I just no. Okay, sorry, we are looking for the person so we can mute him or her. Okay, David, we've muted him. Please go ahead, Mr. Daniel. Yeah, so with an MBA, she can still use it. Uh, MBA is a multidisciplinary. So let's say you are doing PAD, let's say mechanical or electrical engineering, and then your MBA is still going to be useful in your work. Maybe you want to, uh, at the same time, manage uh, mechanical engineering department or something. The MBA will still be useful. So you can file with the MBA and the PAD is still in line or in continuation. But the PAD is more of like a specialized field you are still pursuing. So uh, it doesn't hurt at all. You can still do that. All right. Thank you. Then on YouTube again, um, you're currently on an F1 visa. This is Samuel Uche. And you go home to marry, but your wife comes in on F1. How will you include her on the I-140 paper? Yeah, so you go home and marry and your wife also got admission and came on F1, rather. Yeah, yeah. so if your wife is here on F1, you can still include her. Uh, she's studying, doing her own studies, but you are found and you can list her as your wife because you don't have to hide the fact that you have a wife. It can also work against you. So if you have a wife, a good marriage certificate, everything, uh, nothing hurts you from mentioning her in your petition as a spouse. Okay, perfect. And then before we hand over to um, Salt Lady, so I have a question here. I am on J1 and I am a visiting professor. How do I start the EB2 and IW process? And let me also add a question to it. Like, what are the implications? Can the person still stay after their visiting period and all those things? So how does NIW work for J1 scholars? Yeah, so for J1, it's the same thing as the F1. The only difference is that for J1, you need a waiver, all those on J visas. There's a waiver where the, that is administered by the Department of State that you have to apply for a waiver, that you are not bonded and you are not required to return. Uh, so by default, all J1s are somehow bonded to their original home country by residency. So that residency requirement is what you are applying for a waiver for. And Department of State, also, most of the, Department of State most of the time grants some of these waivers. Uh, unless there's a huge government political uh, implications involved, I think you should be able to get a waiver done. Yeah, and you are able to file it. That nothing hurts you at all. So you can file the I-140 uh, all the same, but still the I-485 and other things, of course, until the waiver is granted, it's very difficult to adjust status. Okay, thank you very much. So right now, um, we're going to give it all, um, over to Salt Lady. So she has a few questions from the WhatsApp groups, and she's also going to talk to us briefly about um, the process and give us some encouragement. So after that, we'll go to the audiovisual, the questions from people who are able to talk. So yes, Salt Lady, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Good evening once again. Um, so the questions I wanted to help ask from the groups, they already shared on YouTube, so I would not be asking that anymore. However, I want to appreciate everyone for joining so far. I know it's a lot to process. And just like Daniela shared, I think the most important thing in all of this, as I share on the groups, is that the simple fact that you applied for a master's or a PhD in America and you got an admission, some of us got funding, that's enough. That's enough to tell you that you are worthy. The big question that a lot of us are asking is this, do I qualify? That's the question. Do you qualify? The answer is yes, you qualify. No matter um, these other things we are asking for um, that, that is required for the three prongs, I know it's a lot to process, but some of us will be like, oh, I don't have no publication or citations. Some people have not attended um, conferences. Some people don't have no, like literally nothing. Um, it looks like you literally have nothing to prove your case, but you do have. It's just a matter of, like Daniel said, for the person that had a bachelor's degree and 
had just six years working experience and got the EB1, not even EB2, EB1 approval. It's a question of you sitting down, looking through all that you have done and just finding things that you can connect the pieces, connect the pieces together. And you will see that you actually qualify more than you think you do qualify for, for this thing. So um, I think one major thing I just want everyone to take away from this meeting today, and like I always put on the groups is this, don't shortchange yourself. You have nothing to lose by, by, by applying for this thing. If you don't get an approval, if you get a denial, if you get a request for further evidence, you can apply again, you can reapply again. It's just like going for a visa interview and you get denied. Many people say, oh, if you get denied the first time, it will affect your chances of getting approved the second time. No. It means that the first time when they denied you visa, it gave you more opportunity to prepare and be better so that when you go next time, you have um, a better case to prove. So um, I just want us to just know this, you qualify. That's the number one thing that I want you to go, go home with. If you have a master's degree, you have done something, you qualify. I also want to say, I had a friend who did not have... Um, she had a master's degree, but she did not have no publication, no citation, and nothing like that. However, she used to volunteer in a community. She would help at the community center to distribute stuff. Although I think it was, I think, engineering, I'm sure. What she did in the community was totally unrelated to a proposed endeavor. But it is what I'm trying to say is the, you know, the way you argue and you advocate for your case. And if you find somebody that can help you, you know, set it the right way, you will get this thing. Like I have another friend who wrote a children's book and a research was on, she, she was proposing to do um, work with uh, minority communities and stuff like that. It would, she was able to connect it together one way or another and it did work. And finally, I would say, so, uh, many people, this is uh, summer, and a lot of us are just going to, you know, enjoy summer, have the feel, um, you know, just relax. I think this is time for you to, for if you're proposing to apply for the NIW, this is a good time. Why we say um, you having publications or citations might not be, like, so important, but if you do have it, it helps you, um, it helps make your case stronger. So this is a good time for you to write something. It could be as simple as a review paper. Um, review somebody's else, somebody else's work or something. Just do something. And when you go for conferences, don't just attend to just attend. Attend to participate. Post a presentation or something. Apply for awards and those things like that. It all boils down together. My, like I would always say that I'm saying it again. You qualify. You qualify. No matter how, I don't know how to put it, how you express it. So far, you have an advanced degree, like the barest minimum. Just if you have the basic requirements, you qualify. Don't show shame yourself. Lawyers will tell you, no, you can't do it. Give yourself that chance. Like I said, all you have to lose basically is that $700 that you will pay for uh, to the USIS for it. That's all you really lose, really, if you don't get it. But if you get it, trust me, it's way better, way better, and solves your problem and solves this immigration pain issue. Yeah, so that's what I want to say. So back to Victor, please continue. Now, thank you so much, Victor, for doing <laughs> this. I really appreciate this. Oh, I know no. it's a lot for me to, because I'm a communications person, so it would be natural for me to be the host. But I thank you so much for taking this meeting. <laughs> and thank no you also, problem. Daniel. I really appreciate you. Yeah, and Israel too. Uh, Victor, before you come in, can I, can I please explain please, this to please, this team please. of questions that people are asking? It's a team of questions that can answer a lot of people's own. There are okay, people good. who got direct bachelor's uh, admission to PAD from bachelor's, okay? And with these people, uh, you ask yourself, after your bachelor's, did you work in Nigeria to meet that five-year requirement? If you don't have that one and still you are in your PAD program and you believe that you have achieved certain stuff on your CV, even on your PAD program, and you think that you can meet this, go for the exceptional ability route, okay? Remember I said even those people 
uh, even without bachelor's, can I still do exceptional ability, bro? Now, in this term, though you have a bachelor's, but you don't have five years, so it doesn't add up as advanced degree. The only difference between these two is that one is starting by stating that I have an advanced degree. Another one who doesn't have an advanced degree is starting by stating that I'm applying as exceptional ability candidates. Okay, and those applying as exceptional ability candidates, of course, you document your national interest of your endeavor and all those things. Then you come straight into a well positioned through the following exceptional ability criteria. You don't document your criteria. You don't go and start like I'm an advanced degree as professional, just like the master's and PhD and bachelor's plus five years before would do. That's the only difference. So if you're in a PhD program and you got your admission directly from bachelor's to PhD, go through the exceptional ability route and trust in your CV. That is depending on whether how far you have advanced in your PhD and how many things you have achieved. Some PhD program also lets you have a master's halfway. Talk to your departments. At times, if they can grant you that, fine, you can also get that master's uh, certificate after two years into your PhD. Other than that, you can equally go through the exceptional ability route. Uh, and if you reach me, I can also be able to assess your CV to see whether you are ready. It depends on the readiness, even in your PhD program. How ready are you? What have you achieved in your PhD? That's it. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much. Okay, so we we have like twenty minutes left. Who are the, who? Can I, well, can I go now? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Please ask your question. Please. Uh, so, uh, after, my, my, hello. Uh, I my question is regarding what you just talked about right now. So I used to be a pharmacist in Nigeria, and I left after approximately three years of practice and straight into a PhD program at a. Uh, in biomedical sciences. And I've been thinking about the five years requirement you need to meet after a bachelor's, um, but it kind of scares me. Or uh, I don't know how to think about it. I mean, I'm in my second year of my PhD and I have two publications right now. And I have a grant to attend the um, a national conference from my school and from the, the body itself. And I'm presenting my poster as well. I don't know if I should go to the EB2 um, or through the EB1. And the second question is um, if I'm, because the whole, the thing people charge to actually do this thing is really exorbitant. And I was planning to do this thing on my own. But you talked about giving it to someone who has experience with that to review it. I don't know if it's, if you get some kind of significant, um, deductions or like charges when someone reviews it for you um, compared to the person preparing your applications for you. Those are the questions I have. Okay, so you have a pharmacy degree from Nigeria and straight into a PhD currently. And of course, from the way you are talking, you have also received some grants, you are going for some conferences. It looks like you are doing a whole lot and you are kind of achieving stuff. So those things you are achieving, you have two years of experience from back home. If you add two years to your bachelor's, it can meet an advanced degree. You can easily go through the exceptional ability route. That's why USA has made that provision. Because I know that they made that provision not to and disadvantage other people who no, mostly will not have a master's at that point in time. Because let's uh, uh, let's face it, there are certain people who don't necessarily have master's, but since they have achieved, not in a PhD can compare themselves to them. Okay, uh, those people, you can't just disadvantage them because of the fact that they don't have master's. So just like your case, you have some work experience, you have some bachelor's degree back home. That is why when you come to, I am well positioned to advance the endeavor. Those criteria, I say we have to meet three. That's why they also began by talking about academic achievements. Every academic achievement you are receiving in relation to this endeavor. So even if you don't have master's degree, what academic achievement do you have? Of course, you have a bachelor's degree, okay? Just that you don't have that five-year requirement. Talk about your bachelor's degree. Talk about some courses you have taken. Then in the PhD, talk about certain things you have, grants, presentation you are going to do, certain uh, tuition waivers. Even your PhD, don't say that I was just given a stipend. Say the fact that your PhD tuition value, total value about 150,000, quantify that over a four year period of annual tuition of a university and mention that it's about packaging, all right? Package yourself, mention certain things that you are having and certain things that you are achieving. Even if the association you join is very small, don't let them know that it's some small association somewhere. Talk big about that association, okay? Because the officer between you and that officer doesn't know American, different between American Chemical Society and some small association in my corner. Okay, you are the person who projects what you are part of. 
and they are supposed to accept it, provided you have provided evidence or proof of membership. That is it. They don't tell you, come and show us how you were interviewed for the association, what you have done in the association, but mention the association as a very reputable one and doing things in line to your endeavor. Okay, yeah, so if you trust yourself, that's why I do a resume review and other things. If I look at your resume and you don't meet it, there's no way I'm going to give you hope, false hope that go ahead for it, especially if you have a bachelor's straight to a PAD. It depends on what you have done in your PAD and what you have achieved. If you are able to meet that three criteria threshold we can do, you go through exceptional ability. I have a client who is like going for nursing. And a normal second time nursing, you need bachelor's plus maybe five years to meet the advanced degree. She's a bachelor's degree in nursing. She has nursing certification. She has an RN license. And I asked her, then why are you not going for, why are the hospital not filing green card for you? And the hospital like, oh, hospital say they are tired. They are not doing through all these things. And I thought, okay, fine. You can go through exceptional ability route. Are you ready to go through that? Because exceptional ability route is there for you to also take advantage of. You have bachelor's, you have licenses, you are a member of this. You have this work experience. Talk about it and all together, all of them will make you exceptional in the field. Yeah, the, I think my major problem is that I didn't think about exceptional ability as a lesser um, category compared to the um, national interest waiver. And um, I kind of was scared again because I practice pharmacy and what I'm doing right now is like entirely different from pharmacy. Although it's medical science, I'm studying viruses and I'm using computational modeling, um, molecular biology and like virology itself to study it. So I was wondering how they're gonna see that if it's like two different things or... Okay, okay, I know your fear. Let me come in for you. Pharmacy, virology, okay? Are they still not in the medical field? They are. Yeah. They go. Yeah. So it's not a complete detour from what you are doing for bachelor's. When I say that what you are doing should be a continuation, for instance, you can't compare mechanical engineering to nursing. Let's say you are doing mechanical engineering in some way, also studying virology, different opposite fields. That is the kind of disparity I'm talking about. But pharmacy, oh. then you are doing virology. Of course, there are some pharmacists that they are pharmaceutical companies that hire virologists. Okay, but then you have to understand the basic theory, the fundamental theory of it before you can even go into drug production and the rest. So what you are doing is not totally different from it at all. They are all aligned to the medical field. It's just accepted. Yeah. Hello. Hello. How do we get? Do you get a very? Do you get a significant decrease in the charges of um preparing your um applications for preparing applications for someone and then or compared to just reviewing the application for someone? Yeah. So for what I do, there are different charges for what I do. But I always say I was telling Solid that if you consider what I do and like what I'm charging for and what lawyers are charging and what they are doing, I'm not saying I'm better than them, but I have clients who have brought denied cases from lawyers. And I can tell you that the work that was put in, I doubt the person who even drafted is a lawyer. Because what I do and what the person said a lawyer did, and even upon responding to RFE, the person got denied. And now we have to salvage the situation by going through certain critical means to safeguard the I-485, the person filed concurrently. So it's something we have to do all of a sudden. But if you all look at it, then of course, what I'm charging with, I'm undercharging myself. But mm -hmm. and then you realize that you are working with students, you are working with Africans. When I was a student, a lawyer said I should bring 6,000. I didn't have that money. And it took me eight to nine months to file my, to prepare my petition. because I wasn't confident in myself. Maybe I don't want other African students to go through that. That's why my charges is are very low. So trust me, no matter how it is, they are very low that you can afford. And uh, some lady can also attest to it. I don't charge extremely high prices at all uh, because you are working with students. Though some come with, to me from Microsoft, other high, high companies that I, I think I should be charging them high, but it's a fair market you have set for yourself. You have to go buy it. You can't say this person is working here, so I'm charging this person 9,000. Oh, you are coming, you're a student, so I'm charging you low. You can even be seen for that, okay? It's an unfair labor, uh, sorry, uh, corporate uh, market practice. So it's just fair price that anybody at all, uh, most people, I won't say everybody, most people can just overcome. Yeah, can okay. I ask my question? Hello? Yeah, Hello. hold on. Hold on. We have multiple people trying to talk. So Mr. Evans, thank you for asking the question. Um, who is the next person on the queue? Myself, please. Myself, please. No. Okay, Myself. okay. This is what we're going to do. Hold on, hold on. I think I can see. I, I've been here for a very long time, raising my hand. Abdul, who, who, who has in, been here for a very long time? Myself, here. Yeah. Innocent. Same thing to me. Okay, this is what we'll do. This is what we'll do. 
please okay we would only allow one person to ask just drop the question in yes, chat. my question is very uh, short hello. my question Don't is me. about training and certificates and, okay and... okay okay hold on i'll go by alphabetical order then so yeah. so abdullah abdullah j please go ahead and, and answer your question oh, that... Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very, uh, for the presentation, uh, Mr. Daniel. My first question has actually been asked regarding switching between trades. But I also wanted to ask that if you are not yet married, but you have like a fiance, is there a way to like declare them during your between end of the application? Thank you. Okay. So fiance, uh, unfortunately, only Canada accepts fiance for the immigration. They call it common law habitation or something. By United States, of course, you need a proof of marriage certificate when you are filing I-140 uh, to add as evidence. So you need to legally marry the person to be able to include her. All right, thank you. So please, can I ask my question, question, please? Who, who, what's your name? Remy Lekun, like R so far. Okay, no problem. Okay, go ahead and ask your question, sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> so what I wanna ask is, I'm gonna be done with my master's in May. And my visa expires in May as well. That's next year. So I'm wondering, is it wise for me to renew my visa first? Of course, I don't pray for them to refuse me. But God forbid, if they refuse my enemy, I know that I already show like an interest or intent to stay in the U.S. And by that time, if I now want to renew my visa for OPT or something, it might work against me. So I'm confused that am I supposed to renew my visa first for OPT because it's a STEM course, public health at um, John Hopkins. So I'm supposed to renew my visa first before I file for my EB2 and IWU. Okay, yeah, so thank you for the question. So let's look at this visa renewal term. It depends on whether you have plans to travel out of the US or you want to stay in the US and finish everything and get- I'm a frequent traveler. I travel very often. Okay, so you are finishing in May. You want to renew your visa in somewhere around May before you start your OPT. So what yeah. I will say is that as you are finishing, mm -hmm. put your applications together, put your petitions together. That's where it takes time. Remember that right now, as we are just talking, maybe the US government make changes like, okay, this year we are giving this visa to Nakota and therefore the dates have become current. And here's the case, you don't even have a petition ready for it. How will you feel, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so get your petition ready. If you have not mailed it to USCIS, they don't have any business with you. They don't even know about it. Okay? Mm -hmm. then when you get your petition ready, then of course, if you want to travel out, travel out and go and renew your visa and come in, then of course, come and battle it out for your kind of your green card. The visa, like I said, is only needed when you are coming in. When you are inside and you file I-140, it doesn't affect your student status in any way. But when you file concurrently, because when I was filing concurrently, it was a risk. If I-485 gets rejected, denied, you can't go back to F1. You have to find a way mm -hmm. to, to, to raise your leg or maybe leave the U.S. But here's the case, I-140 itself doesn't affect your student status in any way, so far as you're in the U.S. But of course, going okay. out to go and apply for visa and coming in is where mm -hmm. you want to ask yourself questions as to if I want to renew, then I would advise that renew it whilst the officer, that officer doesn't know anything about it, so that I don't end okay. up with a lot of explanations, okay? okay. Yeah. But I'm not All saying right. that if you're filing and going to renew, you'll be denied. Mm -hmm. Some people mm -hmm. have tried and they got it. Some people might have tried and maybe it became an issue. Everybody mm -hmm. and their own luck. I've even noticed mm -hmm. H-1B people going for stamping and they got denied while they were even H-1. H-1B <laughs> allowed for dual intents, dual intent to even mm -hmm. immigrate. But even they went and they got denied. So renewal is not automatic at all. And you can't hold the officer to it because getting a visa is a privilege. Okay. Thank you. So just to be sure, yeah, for my OPT, is F1 visa I still need, right? In OPT, you can still transition to OPT. Yes, OPT is an F1. When you are okay. OPT, you are still on F1. Because I was wondering that the counselor might say your, 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 your program ends in May. So why do I want to renew? <laughs> So let me let me let me also sound this word of caution to you. OPT means optional practical training. Optional. Mm -hmm. It's not mandatory for your studies. It's optional privilege which has been added. And I remember during our time there were cases where people were getting denied when they are going to renew visa on OPT. Wow. If I were you, at this particular moment, if it's not that severe, cut down on the travels because. Okay. Uh, you are getting to a critical transition point that you are mm -hmm. determined you want to go back home or you want to continue adjusting yeah. in the U.S. And they'll be keenly looking at it because, of mm -hmm. course, when you apply for student visa, that's what you did. But yeah. maybe you got into a PhD program. That would have been good. 
if you have a PhD program in mind, maybe that one would have been a very good one to go and renew. Because okay. it is optional. The officer can tell you that it's optional. You are done with your program. Stay mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That way you are not coming back. I know somebody who got locked up in UK. <laughs> he's still sitting in UK. He's not able to come back. Because he went wow. to renew on OPT and OPT is optional. Yeah, so take note of that. Thank you. That's very informative. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. So okay, I'm the right next. next. <laughs> yeah. Miriam, Thank right? Thank you. I'm yes. the next. Hold on. Hold on. After Miriam, we have Innocent. And then... Uh, Robert. Robert. After Miriam, Robert. <laughs> After, oh, Lord. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. This is how we do it. Miriam, Robert, and Innocent, the three of you would ask your question. Oh, I'll be here yes, since I'm joined by four. And my hand I mean, has been. Yes, we literally joined you. I raised my hand. I, I, I know people. multiple people. I no, can we hand. just stop the argument, please? Let's just move on. Thank first, you. First lady, first lady uh, I, I, I've been raising my hand since this is innocent. I've been raising my hand since. No, uh, lady, I, can, you, can you add <laughs> maybe okay. some 30 minutes to just allow them? Okay, this is what we'll do. This is what okay. we'll do. Anybody, so the meeting officially ends in the next five minutes, but our guest speaker is saying that he can, um, our guest speaker is saying that he can stay beyond five. So yes, everybody feel free to leave when it's, once it's six o'clock PM, 6 PM Eastern time, or uh, that will be 11 PM if you're in Nigeria or wherever. So feel free to leave. Anybody who still needs like a one-on-one -on -one consultation, you can stay after we leave. So right now we are going to uh, Mr. Innocent and then we'll go to Sorry, Maria. Before Mr. Innocent, so because okay. of people that would leave um, okay. after now. Um, so this meeting was organized because we have a WhatsApp group that people ask questions. It's a community, a huge community where we are free. It's a safe space. We can just talk about the NIW. So that's why we have the group. So. If you want to join the group, I put the link on this Google or the Zoom link so you can join before you leave. So if you can ask the questions there, um, more questions there. And also on the YouTube, there is a Google link there. Also, you can click that link and then you can join the WhatsApp group so you can ask more questions there. And also, um, Mr. Daniel provides services for people that want to write an IW. Uh, people that have RFE, people that have been denied and you want to take another chance at it. So um, I'm going to call his number out like directly. Um, we we'll also, we'll also put it up, but if you want his number, I'm just going to read it out one time um, and because I appreciate him doing this. He has so much information to share. So his number is 585 one one eight zero. I will call it one more time. Five eight five five zero zero one one eight zero. I'm taking the time to do this because I'll be honest with you guys. This process looks um like straight, but little a little mistake can just mess the whole thing up for you. You might think, oh, I don't want to pay the money. I don't want to get a lawyer. I don't want to pay for the service. But I, I assure you, if you make a mistake, you will pay more than what you initially did not want to pay. So, and then, like I tell students here, if you think the money the lawyer will charge you, maybe the lawyer is charging you $4,000, or maybe the writer will charge you, say, $2,500, and you're thinking, oh, you want to save the money, you don't have the money. Trust me, you will spend this money. Like, you spend, you spend money on things that are not even necessary anyway. This is America. We buy stuff that we don't ever need. Why not use that money to do something that is valuable for yourself? I assure you, you will spend that money. That's the truth. You will spend that money. So why not spend it on something that is good? And if you know you're not sure that you can self-petition this thing and do it right, just give someone, really. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. You can go. We'll continue the meeting. And thank you, everybody. Yes. And one last thing I would like to add. We thank you, Mr. Daniel. Um, so if anybody needs um, the service of anyone, so on the Google form, that we've left there's and there's a blank there's a blank um page so it's more like an email it's like you're sending an email to us so if you need if you still need his email address or you need my contact details or salt ladies contact details or israel because he builds websites and he does technical um stuff for people you know graphics design all these things you can also just ask and we can get back to you from there um another thing i would like to add 
is different people will quote you different things. So we are not against lawyers in this group. So we we understand the 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 services they provide because some people are actually licensed to practice immigration law. We also have people like immigration specialists, and then we also have people like knowledgeable PhD students like Toyo Selola. So we have different cadres of knowledge, of knowledgeable people. And whichever one your budget works with is fine. So so people, lawyers charge, you know, a high amount of money. And, you know, they, I believe that they try to put their best effort into it. But you have to talk to multiple lawyers. You know, someone like Mr. Daniel has done it. The good thing is that People, lawyers who aren't as well known as other people, they tend to be willing to accept riskier cases. So people like Ellis Porter and Victoria Chen and some other popular names, they are they take pride in the number of acceptance, their acceptance rates. So if you are coming, you know, if you are coming with a case that is slightly complicated, they will tell you go and get more citations. We need you to have at least a hundred citations. We need you to because. In fact, the people that they are doing these things for can as well self-petition and get it by themselves. They want you to build a strong profile such that when you even have that profile, you even don't need their help. So we have lawyers like that. We have some other lawyers who actually put in the work to help you along the way. And we have immigration specialists and we have friends. So it's entirely your decision, your pockets, your spirits, whatever your mind tells you to do, You know, feel free to go ahead. We are going to also hopefully have some lawyers here and some other immigration specialists. I don't know if she reminded, if she remembered to tell you guys, we're hoping to run this throughout the summer. So yes, so yeah, know. thank you so much, we... Victor. That's true. We'll be running this. It's a series. So it's like you know in Nigeria, we have the four power packed Sundays. Sorry, I'm a funny person too. So that's how <laughs> we'll do this too. So we are having four power packed seminar on EB2 NIW. We want everyone to get their green card. We want everybody to be here. Ain't nobody have to do something. No, they don't like to get their papers. Let's just get it the right way, right? We are intelligent. We can just get it the right way. Thank you. Yes. So the last I spoke with um, Toyosi, she said maybe twice a month. Um, so this is May. We're probably going to have another one in June, um, two in June, and hopefully two in July. But just get back to us through the Google form. The link has been posted on YouTube, and it's also in the Zoom chat. So if we will try to add you to the WhatsApp group and you would get specific information about the, the upcoming um, about the upcoming webinars. So yeah, it's been a pleasure. Um, the other people, I'm going to stop the YouTube live stream now and I'm going to also stop the Zoom recording. So if you want to stay behind to ask um, Mr. Daniel some questions, please feel free to do so, um, you know, have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful night.